And okay. whenever you're ready, John. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Friday. Um, very, very glad you could um, join me today. We have Thomas Schaller. Thomas is a phenomenal artist. Uh, we looked at his colors yesterday. Um, his work is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, he'll be showing a slideshow and going over um, his process. Um, Thomas is a brand ambassador. Um, it's great to see him all over the world. When he would come to Daniel Smith and do a presentation, it was beyond standing room only. In fact, there was no way to get into a room to see um, his demonstrations. They were so very, 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 very popular. And so with that, Thomas, I'd like to um, uh, introduce you and thank you for, for being here today. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, I wanna thank John, um, Catherine, Ethel, everybody at Daniel Smith and uh, everybody who's tuning in. Uh, I'm really honored and happy to be here. You know, we've all gone through a really difficult year or so. So um, I was very reluctant, like I imagine many of you were to engage in some of these online activities, but I've realized there's a great advantage in them and that we have opportunities like this to really discuss art and the business of art and the inspirations and the specifics, materials, etc., and to understand, I think, each other a little bit better than we might have even in live workshops. Although, uh, yeah, I miss those events too. So I think going forward, the world will be an amalgam of live and online events. And uh, I think it's really an exciting new frontier for all of us. Anyway, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I, I am a brand ambassador for Daniel Smith, um, which is one of the proudest things because as a company, I don't wanna sound overly, well, whatever. They make products, yes, great high quality products that most all of us love and use. But why I love Daniel Smith is because they don't just care about things that they make. They care about the people that use them. They care about the artists that use them. They listen to us, they respond to us. The very fact that we're doing anything like this is testament to the fact that, that it is a people-based, company and we're all we're all artists trying to get better and we're all connected in that way and i can't imagine this world with without uh people like john and daniel smith company so thanks so much thank you so much uh, i uh i'm gonna do a little demo for you today i don't know if i'll finish it completely but i hope to but first i wanted to just um go off a bit and show a few of my paintings and really not to show off, but just to uh, describe to you what it is I do and why I do it. So, you have share screen um, on Thomas, so anytime. Yeah, I'll share my screen here. And hopefully this pops up. Can you see it? Yes, we do. Yes. All right, I won't take too long doing this, but uh, before we started today, I was talking about my evolution. Oh, we get some day oh. We okay? There you go. I was talking about my evolution as a painter and I came from a world which was more value oriented than color. Um, the long story. But um, it was quite honestly, Daniel Smith, John in particular, who introduced me to the power of color. Color of course can be used as value, we all know that, but when used properly and within right combinations, I paint now all in complements. I allow most of my pigments to mix naturally on the surface of the paper rather than pre-mixing in the palette as many, painters do. And it's really the, the granularity of certain uh, Daniel Smith pigments that have really enhanced how I paint, uh, why I paint, and I, I like to think the quality of the paintings that result. So anyway, here's my new uh, master artist set, which I couldn't be more proud of. So uh, you can see the colors I used. Typically, I use about 
14 pigments. For this set, I narrowed it down to just 10, and it was a, a somewhat difficult but a fun challenge to select 10 pigments that did everything I want to do. I think I'm guilty of something many of us are, is uh, often having too many pigments in our, in our palette. Uh, often, if you choose wisely and really think about each color and how uh, each pigment uh, reacts to every other pigment, um, your work can advance a great deal just by really concentrating on which elements you use. In my paintings, I talk a lot about uh, editing. Painting is really the act of design. So by that, I mean, you choose what you leave in and what you leave out. And I think the same uh, mental attitude holds for uh, your materials as well. Uh, you don't need every single brush that's out there. You don't need to buy every single thing that's in the store as much as we want to. You just don't have to. So anyway, and watercolor being such a basically simple medium. We use so few things really. So the quality of each of the things that we choose to use matters a great deal. Uh, here I have also, I'm bragging here a bit, I just got a new signature set of Neef brushes out of Australia that have just hit the market. So I'm super excited. I'll be using those today. And uh, of course, my Daniel Smith set. Um, the palette I'm using is made by Steve Finelli. I'm, I'm not pushing these. These are very expensive palettes, but they're beautiful. And I think it's important for all of us to have a good palette with enough mixing wells to do what we have to do, um, whether that's plastic or metal or whatever, but we could talk for hours about materials, I know. Other brushes I use are mostly by Escada. I like the Versatile series in particular, the flats in especially the flats. I have a, a lot of Escada brushes, but the uh, Versatile series is especially useful. I use a lot of different papers, but the Bao Hong uh, Chinese paper, master's choice paper is um, really something worth looking into if you like to paint with texture as I do. And sketches, I do a lot of sketches. So I use a Stillman and Byrne sketchbook. I've got my own series of those as well as Bao Hung paper. Gosh, it's been like Christmas the last year. So I'm very grateful to all these amazing companies. Um, all right, this is just a, a painting I had an NWS few years ago, three years ago, I think. I'm including it because I like it, yeah, but also because it's one of these watershed paintings where I learned something. This is where I was beginning to learn the emotional weight of color and the emotional resonance of complements, warms versus cools. I mean, we all talk a lot about dark versus lights, of course, but in color, I, I think I was a little behind the ball for, a, for years, thinking only about value and not enough about color, um, the emotional weight and the resonance. This is a, a painting, um, oops, sorry, that really uh, talks to my love of compliments. I speak and teach a lot about using compliments in your work. And by that, I don't just mean compliments of light and dark, but also of warm and cool colors, pigments, also about the vertical elements versus horizontal versus diagonal. I also work in more, I, I guess you'd say, poetic interests of the past versus the present, uh, elements of time, and uh, memory versus reality and pure invention, dreams versus the observed world. So uh, this was a, a real exercise for me in editing because I think like many of you, I can get really, really lost in details. Um, 
Yeah, my background is as an architectural artist. I painted uh, proposed buildings for other architects for many years. And I imagined becoming an, an artist, a full-time professional artist would be the easiest thing in the world because that's essentially what I was, except it was the hardest thing I ever did when I woke up one day and I realized I have no clients. All I have to do is please myself. And I had to ask myself, do I have anything to say? And how do I stand out as an artist? And what is my unique take, my unique voice? So that's when I began to come up with this idea of designing my works by using elements of reality versus elements of imagination and pure invention. I do paint plein air and I love it, but I think of it more as a tool. It's something I do to sharpen my skills and my decision-making capabilities. Uh, painting plein air helps you choose quickly and make decisions very fast. But the work that I really love is studio-based work because I get to take those lessons of plein air and apply them in a much more studious way to work that, as I say, is, is half real and half uh, imagined. So yeah, reality is great, but it's really just a starting point for me. Mm. I do figure work as well. I mean, I know people think of me as just doing um, architectural or urban scenes, but I take that sensibility and I apply it to anything, landscapes, figure work, everything we paint has, is a combination of, of shapes, really. It's all just shapes, darks, lights, warms, cool, vertical, horizontal, diagonals, everything is shapes. I, I love finally finding a way in. I took many years of figure drawing, so it's great to finally be able to apply those lessons in a style that fits me and the way I look at the world and see it. This painting is really an exercise in uh, Daniel Smith Green's Jadeite and Serpentine in particular, but uh, it also displays my love of negative shape painting. Uh, watercolor, I always tell my teaching groups is a subtractive medium, meaning you start with a blank sheet of paper that has all the light you're ever going to need. What you as a watercolor artist have to do then is subtract away some of that light to display its, its radiance and it's the glorious nature of light only comes alive when you really study shade and shadow and dark areas. So I work a lot in doing, in painting areas of luminosity and darks to preserve and really enhance the light. Um, this is in Havana, Cuba. And uh, anyway, it's one of my favorite, it's a plein air work, but a very um, beautiful city. I, I am fixated on cities, I won't lie, because my interest in contrast really come alive when I'm in the city. New York, uh, where I live for most of my life, where this painting is, taught me that. Uh, positive, negative shapes, lights, darks, verticals, horizontals, but also people. No city, no building is very interesting to me without um, thinking about the people that live there or work there or have to interact with it every day. The volumes of cities excite me, but also the lack of volumes. Again, the, the found, the lost shapes. This was a view from my apartment in the winter. It's such a cold day that this massive city just seemed to quiet down and float literally almost in midair in the chilly cold of a winter's day. And it's a watershed painting for me when I began to understand the power in a watercolor comes from areas that you don't paint as much as from areas that you do paint. Areas of the painting that you save untouched are precious. And when juxtaposed with the areas that you paint heavily, um, 
I could spend another 200 years if I had them learning the lessons of that. But it's a little uh, precursor to what I'm doing today. Um, I don't do a lot of still life painting, but I do like it. I think a good painter should be able to find a subject anywhere they look or any, anywhere they imagine. So I think playing with scale is something a lot of us as, as artists tend to ignore. Uh, we have habits, I do at least. I looked at a lot of my old work and realized I sort of stand at a similar distance from a lot of my work. So I started to challenge myself to do some very close up work as well as some very distant work, as well as playing around with perspectives but very close in paintings such as the still lives, you really get to play with the uh, contrast that I'm talking about. The horizontals, the verticals, the diagonal energies that read through your painting can establish stories within stories and worlds within worlds that I find as a painter just endlessly uh, exciting. So I always say this to my groups too, um, how you paint is interesting, what you paint is important, but why you paint in the first place is the essential question. Why is it you paint? Um, what is it you're trying to get at? When I jury work and when I critique my own work, the very first thing I ask is, why did the artist paint this? What was he or she trying to tell us what were they trying to get the painting to say? What is the intention of the painting? So before anything else, I think about the intention of my painting and all the other decisions I have to make in terms of composition, shapes, color, et cetera, all come from that first question. What's my intention? I may not even have an answer, but at least I think I'll have a direction for the painting. And that's often all I need. This painting is completely fictional. I love to do completely fictional work and I have ever since I was a young kid. It's called Inside and it's sort of a, sort of a commentary, I guess, on the year 2020 and a little bit of 2021 where we're all stuck inside. So I used all these elements that I've been discussing of compliments, cools, warms, lights, darks, et cetera to try to tell a story of um, inside versus outside, locked away versus open. And uh, anybody can read into it, whatever they will, but that was the intention of this painting. Uh, this is another purely imaginative, uh, no subject matter. People ask me a lot if this is a self-portrait. Uh, it's not, but it's sort of a metaphorical self-portrait of me over all my years. I think most of my years, I looked something like this guy, hunched over a drawing table with a blank sheet of untouched paper, trying to work out an idea. To me, nothing is more exciting than a blank sheet of untouched paper because the world is open to you. Anything could happen on that paper. So that's what the intention of this painting is all about. Uh, some people have found it sad. Other people find it joyous. I find it uh, hopeful. Just it's a painting about hope, determination, tenacity, and possibility. The last painting I'm showing is uh, a little thread from my old life. Of, of, I did a lot of work in the movie industry and theater design set design, et cetera, and also architecture and also architectural artwork. And now as a fine artist, I tried to corral all those different interests and all those different uh, sensibilities into one image. And also uh, the intention of this painting, um, well, is a long story behind it. But in brief, it was just a reaction again to the last year or so that we've all been living through collectively. Uh, it's a meditation on connection and isolation and lack of connection and life in the city versus uh, how lonely and isolated you can be even if you live in a 
vast city. And uh, this painting was all about that, as well as about hope and the unexpected future. Um, there's a lot of symbolism and metaphors going on here that I won't bore you with. But uh, this was my favorite painting of last year, and I'm very happy that I did it because it contains all my various interests. And it won quite a few awards and uh, different shows. Uh, and it contains all my various interests. And it won quite a few awards and uh, different shows. Uh, Do you want to use this? Just a gentle so, reminder, friends, to kindly mute your microphone and unmute it only when you have questions for Thomas. Thank you. Okay, guys, so that is that. I'll shut off screen share. Um, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, some of these beautiful darks that we're seeing with, uh, I'm just curious, is that uh, raw umber or is that lunar violets? Well, my darks are always combinations of compliments. So there's never one answer. But sort of my go-tos are ultramarine and burnt sienna as a compliment, makes a beautiful luminous dark. Um, a dark red with a dark green is a perfect way to get dark without going black or gray or muddy in any way. I'm using this Mayan orange with uh, jadeite green and you get a spectacular dark effect. It looks very nearly black and yet it still is luminous lively and it doesn't die on the surface of the page the way you know i don't have anything against any pigment anything that works for you i think you should use uh, i just really love playing with compliments to get darks so that's what's going on there also the amount of water that you use if you use less water and paint not opaquely but slightly less fluid uh, the saturation of the pigments of course will read darker than than they would if you put more color in. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. May I ask another question? Of course. In your painting bonsai, do you use white or gouache? Uh, no, I did, I did not. I, I'm not opposed to it. I'm not a purist in that sense, but I do like the challenge of saving the whites of my paper. Um, sometimes I'll be honest, it would be easier if I used masking or gouache, but I don't like to, I, I will, if it's an emergency to be perfectly honest, but in that painting, no, there was no gouache. There were some splatters of, uh, yellow, but that was just almost opaque cadmium yellow. I just splattered on the surface, but no, I didn't do any masking. Any other questions? I think questions, Tom, will come in um, as you do the demo. And these yes. will be from coming in from Facebook stream. We are live with, I think we have 60 audience from Facebook. And, Hi, in, Zoom, <laughs> and in Zoom, we, we are 144. Hey, guys, on Zoom. OK, um, I'm don't have a lot of time to do a demo today, but I'm going to try to do something that's a little bit uh, in my interest these days, um, similar to the bonsai I did earlier, but I'm doing it because it's still, even though it's almost a still life and close up, it incorporates a lot of my, my various interests. I love to draw probably almost as much as I love to paint. However, it's a mistake, I think, to overdraw your base um, image before you start to add watercolor to it. I can get carried away with my drawings. I did a little bit more on this than I might normally do just because I wanted it to show on camera. But um, I have bonsai trees, so they are one of my interests. I was complaining in 2020 because I couldn't travel as much as I I used to live on airplanes and, ah, uh, yes. 
twice a year, go to Italy and, and uh, one of my sisters once hearing me complain about that said, oh, shut up, you color for a living. You should be able to paint wherever you are, just shut up. So I got a little offended, but then I thought about it and I realized, you know what, she's right. If you're a good painter or a painter at all who loves to paint, Sadly, you don't have to get on an airplane and fly to Italy, although I'm happy to do it any day. So hopefully that will happen. I'm supposed to be there in the next couple of months. But you should be able to look around your kitchen or living room or backyard or wherever you are and find amazing subjects to paint. I love bonsais. I have quite a few. Uh, and this is one I selected for a study today. I didn't do a preliminary study for it. I went right to watercolor paper, but I think you can see what I've done is I've interpreted it a bit. This bonsai is almost 900 years old. It's ancient and it's massive. Of course, it wasn't good enough for me, so I had to redesign it a bit by twisting it a little bit more and giving it a little bit more serpentine quality on the page. Uh, briefly, I decided to go with a um, square format. In my workshops, we work a lot on formatting your work. I think often as painters, we don't think about our formatting. I think we have habits. I can't speak for all of you. I just, I'll speak for me. I have habits. I would probably naturally gravitate to vertical formatted paintings almost always. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but every now and then it's good to just ask yourself, is that the best way to show this particular painting? Uh, so I force myself sometimes to do a little study or to think about What's another way? What's a potentially better format? So in this painting, I've decided to go with a square format. Um, the reason is because a horizontal format tends to pull the energy and the eye of the viewer, I think, outside of the image, left and right. And a vertical format tends to pull the eye of the viewer up and down. It sets up connections both within the work and as the abstract expressionists of the 50s talked about beyond the canvas. A square format, however, by contrast, um, slows all that energy down and pushes the viewer into the work rather than outward. And I thought for the subject, for a bonsai tree, to keep with that Eastern sensibility and the quietness and the Zen-like atmosphere, a square format would really be potentially the way to go. So that's what I've done. And I've redesigned reality to fit the square format. For anybody asking what I'm doing, I'm using a, an Escoda three quarter inch flat versatile series. Uh, and I'm laying in a yellow background and sort of a not fully dry brush, but almost completely dry brush way. Oop. What happened? Yeah. This, um, hang on. Okay. Yeah. We're back. I saw Ed Helms on YouTube. <laughs> uh, I'm using just straight cadmium yellow deep for now, I'm using yellow because I'm gonna be using a lot of deep warms and uh, really deep greens and some blues. I'm gonna save a lot of the twisted ancient trunk of this tree as white or nearly so. So this is really just sort of a, a, a complimentary background to all the cools that are coming. I wanted to a warm background to help offset all the cools that I know are coming. The paper I'm using is a Baohong Master's Choice rough surface. 
300 grams or 140 pound. Um, I love rough surface textures with, in combination with more granular pigments that I love from Daniel Smith. The reason is because uh, the heavier granulate, more granulated pigments tend to sink down into the little valleys of the rough paper and float over the little mountaintops. And you get that, what I think, that characteristic, beautiful uh, shimmer of watercolor that really enhances its uh, transparency and its luminosity. That's why I like rough paper. The other reason is because, as I said earlier, I like my pigments to mix naturally on the surface of the paper rather than, um, rather than in my palette first. So a rougher textured paper sort of allows those transitions that happen on the surface of the paper to occur more a little bit more slowly and organically. They give uh, the pigments just a few more moments to blend more naturally. You always paint first the background? Uh, almost always, it depends on the nature of the painting. But if I'm doing a landscape or a cityscape, uh, I will, tend to paint the things that are farthest away first. Uh, skies, for example, not always. There are exceptions, but often, yes, that's true, I do. Uh, as I get down near this area, I'm dropping in um, a little bit of the Mayan orange into wet in wet into the Acad yellow to add a little bit of orange and a little bit additional intensity. Where the darkest dark area of your painting meets the lightest light, that's where your center of focus is going to be. I'm breaking my own rule a little bit. I almost always do an initial value study. I didn't do it in this case because I just don't think it's necessary. I know that right here is going to be the center of focus. So I want all of my richest colors, my, my brightest brights, my darkest darks, and my highest level of contrast to occur right in the center of the square formatted painting. So that's why I'm beefing up the uh, saturation and the intensity of the tonalities of all the color right here. Thomas, what's the angle of your board? Oh, good question. Um, yeah, I tend, I mean, I always work on an angled surface. If I'm working on site plein air, I work probably at a 45 degree angle. In the studio, I tend to work at about a 35 degree angle. Uh, this is sloped, you can't tell from the overhead camera, but it's about uh, 20 degrees. It's just, it's a little flatter than I would normally work. But it's a great question because I'm not speaking for you guys, but many people in my classes tend to plunk their paper flat on the board and they end up with a lot of blossoms and unfortunate uh, mm. shaped vegetable matter. But really, you know, it's a fluid medium. Water is so essential, obviously, to water color. So why not use gravity, which so far is free, they haven't managed to charge us for it. Why not use gravity as yet another tool? Uh, I keep my boards always loose. With the stuff. Even if I'm painting plein air, I will fix my paper to my board, but I'll keep it loose so that I can raise it up to increase the amount of gravity, which will uh, speed up the transitions of one color to another and allows um, paint to run down the page quicker. If I'm painting a sky, you can tilt the board this way and that 
And just by the tilt of the board, you can create the sense of um, movement or wind in the sky or in water, et cetera, et cetera. So, sorry, long answer to a short question. Great answer. But yeah, I really think people, uh, painters need to think about uh, gravity. It's along with your finger, it's still a, the cheapest artist material you can buy. So here with a small flat brush, without a, uh, I don't know, I bought this brush on the street in Rome many years ago. So I can't even promote the manufacturer because it doesn't seem to have one. I paid less than a euro for it. It's quite honestly a piece of junk, but I love it because it's, uh, it's all synthetic, which means I can't, doesn't hold a lot of water. So it means I can get a lot of these dry brush marks that I like to add texture very easily. Um, may I ask what colors you're using now on the trunk? Yes. On the, under, on the undersides of some of these larger branches, I'm using um, a warm and cool complement, uh, French ochre and alt, uh, cobalt blue. So not too dark, because I want the sense of luminosity even in the darker parts of that tree. The real darks will come in the, uh, the foliage or the pine needles that I'm adding. So yeah, this is cobalt and French ochre. Um, also, I probably will be using little bits of uh, burnt sienna light if I wanna add some real warmth. So here's a little bit of that I'm just dropping in. But I'm just trying to do this quickly, so I'm not gonna get too fussy. I also changed the uh, reference material from the photo so much that I'm not even looking at that. I'm just sort of inventing this as I go. A while ago, I got into a mostly friendly argument with a plein air painter who was telling me that the best thing we could ever do as artists is just to go out, set up our easels and paint exactly what we see in front of us. And I could not disagree more strongly. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I said something smart assy like, well, isn't that what a camera is for? Um, this guy didn't like that. So uh, there are all sorts of philosophies about how much liberty you should be allowed to take as an artist with what you see in front of you and how much you should be allowed to change the real world. And I'm proud to say, I think you should do whatever you want and can to make it a better painting. You're gonna be judged by your painting, not by the subject necessarily. Well, if you do a painting of the Eiffel Tower, for example, yeah, probably it should look pretty much like the Eiffel Tower, but even then, you're the artist. You should have the freedom to make whatever changes, alterations, uh, you feel make a better painting. It's the identity, the spirit of the painting that matters, not, not necessarily the subject from whence it came. And yes, if anybody wants to argue with me, I'm happy for that argument. I love that discussion. So, Somebody, because you do a lot of studio work, what is what is a, a rough time that it takes you to finish a piece? That's another great question. Um, 
probably within a day. I don't like to spend more than a day on any painting, even a very large complex painting. And I don't say that because I think that's the right answer. It's just what works for me. In my old life, commercial corporate world, I would spend as much as two and three weeks on a painting with countless washes and layers. And I think so. I think what I'm saying is that I just wanted something different as a professional artist. I wanted the immediacy that watercolor afforded me to get something done pretty quickly, hopefully within a couple of hours. Um, but a really more formal painting, yeah, I'll spend up to a day on it. I don't think, well, very rarely would I spend more time than that. It's incredible because your, your work looks so um, complicated, so beautiful. I mean, so multifaceted, the lines, the buildings, the lights, the darks, that's a lot to have in your head. Well, I do studies for those, those imaginary cityscapes and things like that. I sit at home. Um, I mean, ever since I was a kid, I, I don't go anywhere without a sketchbook. So um, I'm always working out ideas for paintings in a sketchbook. So I don't want to imply that I just sit down and dream all of that out of nothing necessarily. A lot of that comes with a lot of sketches and ideas beforehand. Yeah, they're absolutely beautiful. And do you work on more than one painting at a time or is it you do one till it's finished and then proceed to the next? For some reason, I'd always love to say I work on several paintings at once, but the honest truth is no, I don't. I tend to just concentrate on one painting I think because I want to keep that immediacy alive, I try not to work on, or I just am not able to work on two paintings at once. There are occasions where I'll be doing a set of paintings for some reason, and they need to match or at least belong to each other in some way. So in those cases, sure, I would, I would work on two at once, but generally no, just one at a time. How do you avoid not getting blooms going back into your, that's amazing. Uh, I am getting bleeding, but that's another thing. When you work so immediately on a painting, you have to sort of stage one area to the next so that you, uh, nothing is totally dry, but you can tell when the shine goes away that it's probably dry enough that you can go back in and still hold an edge if you, if you need to. Okay. And you, um, do you pre-wet pre your paper or you don't wet your paper beforehand? Oh, no, I work on dry paper. Dry, okay. Um, large sheets or big formal paintings, I will wet the back of the paper first and staple it down to a stretcher board mm -hmm. and allow it to dry overnight, usually. But smaller paintings, half sheets or so, nope, I just tape them down and work on dry paper. Uh, that's changed. In the old days, the, the sizing of watercolor paper was very different. It was all animal based. And you pretty much had to stretch all of your watercolor paper. More wa modern watercolor paper is, uh, they use alternate techniques to size it. So um, the necessity to stretch them is just not there. You don't have to do it necessarily. So uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, about 16, 17 minutes, but we can go a little bit longer. All right, I should be good. I just wanna get some of the, the basic elements of the branch structure in and this toggle between cools and warms. Again, I'm using French ochre, uh, cobalt blue, and in some of the areas where I want a little more intensity, I'm dropping in some of this beautiful burnt sienna light. Uh, I'm doing this because I'm gonna be doing the foliage next and I do want some of that to hold an edge. So 
I'm doing this first so that the yellowish warm background has a chance to set enough so it'll hold an edge, which is backwards from the way I normally do trees. I usually do the areas of leaves or foliage first and do the uh, trunks later, but this is a very special tree. So it gets a very special treatment. But I'll speed it up. I loved your comment when you said it's about taking the white away because you're already starting with the maximum amount of light because the paper is white and it's seeing you do it's actually so interesting to see. I think it's one of the most obvious and often overlooked components of watercolorists, what we do as watercolorists. A lot of us who are training, I think, we studied oil. And of course we're taught, or uh, many of us are taught the importance of doing an underpainting. Um, and you just can't approach a watercolor like that necessarily. Some people do and it works, but once you kill all the light of the page, all the white, once the white is gone, it's pretty much time to go have cocktails because there's very little you can do to get that white back. So for me, at least the way I paint, it's very important to identify the areas of the painting that I know I'm gonna to wanna to save as light and do everything in my power to preserve them. You can always take away light, but it's just not possible to add it back too easily once it's gone. Yeah, there's scraping and scrubbing and scratching and white opaque paint. And again, I have no problem with anybody who does those things. Um, I've done those things, but I'm never very happy when I'm trying to scratch back white that I could have had if I just thought a little bit better and saved it to begin with. So when I sort of twisted my mind around to think of watercolor as a, really a medium of subtraction, subtracting away the light and preserving the white you want to highlight, I don't know, it changed how I thought about watercolor and it definitely changed how I paint. Which blue are you using right now? Sorry, what's that? Which, which blue are you using? Still cobalt. I haven't used any other blue but cobalt. Oh, that's a, a little bit of neutral tint on the dark side. Just to get dark really quickly. Right, okay. I think the yellow of the background should be dark enough. I can start suggesting some of the uh, leaf foliage pine tree coverage. I'm using this uh, liner brush by uh, Da Vinci. Not a lot of water in it. It has uh, long quills that stick out of the top and a big fat barrel at the bottom. So it will hold a good deal of fluid, but everybody has their own way of painting trees. But using a brush like this really works for me because I can lie it on its side and just sort of scrub it across the surface. And you get these really organic, if you're lucky, natural looking areas of leaves. And uh, they're very aerated. They show areas of the light and air through the bottom. And um, I have been really guilty in the past of overworking my trees and making them look much too tight and overworked. And this this kind, this brush really helps me to just take a deep breath and just do it. Just uh, not worry about it. The human mind is a wonderful thing, but it can be, a, it can get in our way a lot of times and causes us more trouble than, <laughs> I think if we just take a deep breath and trust our instincts, we can do a lot better sometimes. Right, so I'm gonna be doing these uh, areas of foliage in um, different passages. 
this is one of the most important because it's in the center of focus. So I wanna keep this nice and wet. And I use one of my small mops to drop in some, um, some of the Mayan orange into the lower areas of this jadeite green wash. Uh, again, compliments. I think if you modify your greens with a little bit of uh, warm, everything starts to look a little bit more organic, lively, and uh, I don't want to use the word realistic, but believable, I suppose. It feels right. And everything uh, stays luminous without getting murky, dark, gray, or muddy. So I'm not trying to overdo it. I'm trying to work quickly because I want to put in these thinner branches too now and have them all melt together into this larger green wash. But uh, this deep red mixed with the deep green um, implies some curvature and uh, shape to some of these areas of um, foliage that I scraped in with that other brush. Right, now, before this dries, I'm gonna take um, a little bit of the burnt sienna. And there is a little bit of neutral tint, if I'm honest, mixed in with this. And with one of these small mops, I'm gonna try to add in the smaller branches in a, almost like calligraphy. I took a course in calligraphy in Japan and my little feeble mind was blown. Those guys are so good. I mean, obviously it's a discipline that takes a lifetime to even begin to master, so. Uh, but I learned a lot, just more, more practical things. I learned that if you can hold your brush back as far as you can, and if you can turn off your critical mind and just paint tree branches in calligraphy intuitively and not overthink, they often look much more beautiful. For 30 some years as an architect, I think I drew and painted everything like this. I clutched my pencils and my brushes and I literally didn't breathe. I think there were days when I didn't take a breath. And I learned in my calligraphy course, also in yoga and other, <laughs> other interests, uh, the importance of breathing. Just let it go. Um, if you do, you'll paint in a much more fluid and uh, you'll be a lot happier. Thomas, do you mind that your pencil marks show through your finished work? No, generally I like it when they do. As I said earlier, I love to draw. I think drawing is uh, integral to my technique and I get it. It's not integral to everyone's technique. But it is to mine, and so I don't want to deny the pencil work. I think it's important for it to uh, become part of the, uh, the whole. But that said, also, I think, as I said earlier, if you overdraw your base sketch, it can look a little false and a little uh, tight. So I think if you just indicate the main areas, uh, you'll be in good shape. But yeah, I don't mind if the pencil line shows. I like it. So that's the approach I'm going to take, uh, generally speaking. One of the little thing I can talk about is uh, if you end up with edges that you think are a little too um, insistent or strong, or you want to encourage tones to bleed on the paper a little more, this handy dandy water mist bottle is a lifesaver. I use it all the time. Also, you can work up other areas of contrast in your work. By that I mean, 
if this is the area of focus, and if you want that area or this to be out of focus, you can uh, play up the edges really strongly in the focal point and then soften the edges on the outside of that area with the uh, water mist gun really easily. So it's just, just another tool. Uh, mine is a, a Holbein mist gun and costs, I don't know, they're very easy to find, cost a couple of bucks. It's not the only one out there, but if you don't have one and you wanna get one, I would recommend finding one with as fine a mist as you can. I've had people come to my class with these water pistols or jet packs they bought at the store and they, if too much water comes out, that's a huge problem. It'll just blow all the pigment right off your page. You don't want that. So here uh, at the base of bonsais, there's often a, a bed of moss. And I'm adding some here to try to connect visually to what's going on up there. I don't want this to take over the painting too much. So I'm gonna use my mist gun over on this area to get it to uh, fade away a little bit. And also just to try to give a little bit of a, a nod to that Asian way of painting and some of the mystery and poetry that's sort of all part of the bonsai culture. This whole tree is sitting in this um, ceramic um, low pot. So I am going to include a little bit of a different color there. Blue, I believe. So this is some cobalt teal blue. I don't Where is that 900 year old bonsai located? It's he near here. There's, <clears throat> sorry, there's a plant nursery just down the street from me here in Venice, California. Uh, and they sell, you know, they sell garden supplies, but it's run by a Japanese American family. And in the back, they have a collection of bonsais. Some are for sale and some like this guy are not. And I love it because it's almost like a museum. They let anybody come in and look at these, but they're just not for sale. And it's such a, I don't know, it's a little thing, but it's such an un-American thing that you could look at something and somebody say, oh no, not for sale. And I love that because America, you know, everything's for sale but not these guys. So they have a, just this spectacular collection of ancient bonsai trees. One thing they specialize in are um, bonsai that are uh, in groups. So they have little mini forests of bonsais uh, as opposed to just single trees. It's just uh, beautiful. It's just a store, but I go there a lot just sometimes to get away from everything and calm down. At the so Huntington yeah, beautiful what's that? Bonsai. At the Huntington uh, Library in Pasadena, uh -huh. they have a beautiful collection of bonsai. They do, and I'm glad you brought that up because the Huntington Library is a, one of the jewels of Southern California. Not enough people go. They have a um, pretty authentic both Japanese and Chinese gardens there, as well as just about everything else you could imagine. Cactus, their cactus collection is something to behold. So here in, in near Seattle, we have the Warehouser Corporation, which is a major wood company, and they have a huge bonsai collection. Next time you're here, I'd love to take you. And they also have uh, rhododendrons from all over the world. I have heard about it, but no, I have never been. 
So for the rest of the painting, now that I'm getting sort of away from the center of interest, I'm using a little more water, a little less pigment, a little less saturation. Um, it's just sort of a subtle way to sort of push the eye, I hope, down into this area. And I mean, I'm not going to get this painting entirely finished for you. I apologize, but I hope to get the main elements established so you can at least see what my thinking is. Thomas, what speaks to you as to when it's done? Oh, what a question. Yeah, I'm asked a lot, when are you done with a painting? Um, I've not answered that question for myself very accurately a lot. I think it's when you are painting along. <laughs> uh, let's see how I can make a short answer. We love to paint, I do. So when things are starting to go right in my painting, I have to remind myself that there's gonna come a point where you're gonna have to stop painting, dude. So I think it's when I start to hear that voice inside my head say, maybe it just needs this one more little thing. When that voice gets loud enough, I tell myself, don't listen to it. And whatever that thing is, don't do it. It's not always true, but more often than not, it is. I look back at a lot of my work and I think like most of us, I'm probably my harshest critic. And I would say where I've gone wrong in the past in my older work is overworking it, not stopping soon enough. I nowadays much prefer a watercolor that's slightly underfinished to one that's completely overcooked. So, yeah, I try to stop a little bit just before I think I should stop. And almost always I'm happier. So yeah, for the background, uh, I'm doing the same treatment, but again, just a little less pigment, a little less um, detail, and a little less saturation. Now here, I'm gonna go over with a little bit of this yellow ochre and try to knock back some of the light that's right at the top, not the light, but the pure white, to bleed some of these areas together and to keep the top of the painting a little bit more mysterious than the rest of the work. <clears throat> yeah, this is just yellow ochre um, and on this really rough textured paper with a flat brush like this, uh, you get this really lovely, I think, um, textural marks. A little bit more I'm gonna do up here and then I'll be essentially done. Later, after we're finished, will I continue to noodle with this? Oh yes, no doubt. But I'm gonna to try to take my own advice and not overwork it. I think uh, if I can keep the spontaneity uh, alive, I will be much better off. I really love watercolors that look almost wet even after they're completely dry. And that's that's almost always the look I'm going for. Um, how long have you been uh, working on this subject matter? How long have I been working on? Bonsais? Oh, on actual bonsais or paintings? Painting bonsais. Oh, this is only my maybe my third one. Do you have a bonsai collection? I do, I have about 10 of them. None of them are 900 years old though. I'm old, but I'm not that old. I think my oldest one though is about almost 100 years old. Wow. 
beautiful, but it just takes forever for these, this much character to develop. So uh, all the main elements of the painting are in. What remains to be done is it's still, everything's pretty wet. So what I do now is I sit back a little, I assess where I am and I'll start just making important connections. I think we're just about out of time. So uh, I can stop any time. What I'm gonna do is add some smaller twigs and then <coughs> to begin to connect areas. I think that's another one of my recurring themes in my classes, uh, connections. Everything in your painting, I think, should connect to everything else in your painting. I really don't like my work when I look at it and it looks like I painted a little bit here and a little bit there and it, it looks a little paint by number. So I do whatever I can in my power to make sure in big ways and small, everything connects. Thomas, can you, uh, I know you're not quite done. Can you um, put your finished piece onto Facebook so we can all see the finished piece? Of course I will, yeah. Uh, it's not quite done, yes, but I'm gonna just do a little bit more of this work and a little bit more clarity just down here in the center of focus. There's a shadow that needs to happen under here, for example, that needs to, this needs to be quite dry before I can do that. So, but yeah, of course I'll post it. But I, I'm glad at least I got a good percentage of it done live. It was nice to watch it come alive. It's so, fun to paint these organic shapes so different than uh, man-made objects. So would any of you have on Zoom, do any of you have any questions you'd like to ask Thomas, please, it'd be a great time to do so. Yeah, ask away. Will you be dropping in any of the Mayan orange uh, anywhere else towards the top or just keeping it down in that other area? Uh, I will drop a little just in here, but I don't think I want any up in the top portion or the bottom portion. I'm trying to keep all the highest compliments and contrast just here. I really don't. As a professional artist, do you complete light fastness tests on all of your pigments? I Before I buy them, I make sure they, uh, are at least relatively light fast. When I started out, I just never thought about that. And I used to be very, for example, uh, enamored with uh, rose matter, genuine. It's a beautiful color, but it also smells fantastic. But I was very delighted once I sold two paintings to a collector that were very heavy with rose matter. And I think two months later, he called me and said, all the red is faded. So sorry for the long answer, but yes, light fastness of paint is not something you should dismiss. It's very important. If you're gonna be a professional artist and hope that your work endures, you do have to think about that. All right, guys, well, that's the bulk of this. I think uh, we're a little over time, so I'm gonna call the time clock. And uh, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to do my best to answer. Where's Otis? He's, yeah, where's Otis? He's right here. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I was wondering the same thing. Where's Otis? I want to say goodbye. Oh, there he is. Hi, Odie. Hi, guys.
Okay, so um, I think that's about it. Before I can finish any of the rest of this, I have to let this part dry, but. Um, this, is, this is us, Thomas. There's 131 of us in Zoom and over 90 in Facebook. Wow. Wow, that's great. Well, I really appreciate all your time and attention. And uh, we appreciate one you. Day, the one day the world will change. And I hope to see you all again in the real world. <laughs> okay. For now, this is not too bad. Thanks not again, John. Thank, uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, John. It's wonderful. Yeah, and everybody again. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Beautiful. much. It was great. Oh, my. Way to go, Gabriel. <laughs> cool. thank you so much. Hey, Gabriel, that's cool. Amazing. Nice, Gabriel. Thank you, Tom. Okay, guys. Thank you, John. Okay, bye. Thank you.